Welcome back. In this video, we will get started with data visualization. We received a gentle introduction to data visualization in our previous video on data exploration, where we saw how histograms help us understand the shape of the data. We also looked at ANSCOM's quartet, where four data sets with completely identical summary statistics turned out to be very different from one another. Let's bring up the graphic one more time. Each of these data sets comprises of 11 observations of two variables, x and y. As you can see, even though many of the descriptive statistics are identical across these data sets, the data is nowhere close to similar, either in distribution or in relationships. In data set 2, we see a parabolic relationship between x and y, like so. Whereas in data set 3, we have a linear relationship between x and y except for this one outlier over here. In data set 4, we have no relationship between x and y because the value of x stays the same no matter what the value of y is except for this one outlier here. The only way to understand these differences would be by graphing the data, and we wouldn't have seen this had we not created these plots. The reason data visualization is extremely powerful is because it is aligned with our brain's evolution to quickly detect patterns in visual information. Some of these patterns stand out almost viscerally to us. These are called pre-attentive attributes, or patterns that we can discern without thinking. For example, we can use differences in length to create the omnipresent bar chart here. Differences in marker color and sizes help us distinguish information in scatter plots, like so here, and so on. Visualizations are a very powerful tool. They help us explore data like we just saw and to summarize vast quantities of information in a single graphic. They also help us compare quantities by putting them visually side by side. They help us understand trends over time periods and above all, they help us tell a story. They help us tell a story to ourselves first and help us narrate it to others. And with that introduction, before we launch into different types of charts that we will be covering, let us look at some key things to keep in mind when we create graphics. First, like for everything we do, we need to understand who our audience is. Are we addressing senior management? Or are we addressing a bunch of statisticians and data science experts? The messaging and the Choice of graphics has to be appropriate to the audience. You should also know your data. Often, in the rush to create graphics, we get so involved in the detail that we forget to step back and look at the key trends or the big points that pop out from our analysis. We need to take the time to understand the data so we can tell the story. We should also think about the delivery mechanism. And what I mean by that is, whether the graphic or the chart that we will create will be delivered, say, in a PowerPoint or in a PDF report or over the web. The next most important thing to take care of is to select the right visuals. There are different chart types that apply to different kinds of data, and we need to be sure that we have selected an appropriate chart type. For example, for continuous data, a bar plot may not be the right choice, we need to use a histogram. And similarly, for a time series, time series data, we would rather use line charts as opposed to anything else. The next point is to use common visual cues in charts. What that means is a similar look and feel. So every time your audience is presented with a graphic, they don't have to launch themselves on a new learning curve to understand what is important, what stands out, and how to understand the, the graphic. 
Common visual cues means using similar colors, similar kinds of pointers to highlight outliers or other things that you are trying to uh, bring out through your graphic. Make your point stand out. Let the graphic do the talking on its own without you having to provide a commentary. Consider the data ink ratio. The phrase data ink ratio was coined by and popularized by Ed Tuft, who is uh, an expert, uh, who was an expert in data visualization and did a lot of work in the field. And what it refers to is the ratio of ink that is used to present actual data compared to the total amount of ink that is used in the graphic. What that means is you need to optimize the data ink ratio in a way that most of the ink used for your graphic, or rather in the modern world, the pixels in your graphic are devoted towards showing the data as opposed to redundant information such as grid lines or uh, other, uh, other objects that are intended just to make the graphic more pretty. The next point is to make sure that you're always credible. Don't play games with access. Uh, don't use 3D or other effects to uh, make your point in a way that you lose credibility with your audience. Consider repeatability. And what that means is very often we will spend a lot of time creating a masterpiece graphic that takes an immense amount of effort to create. You can almost be absolutely sure that once you create a graphic, eventually you will be asked to recreate it maybe the next month or the next quarter. And then again, you don't want to launch into a new project every time. So think about how that graphic would be created by yourself or others in the future. As I mentioned, avoiding 3Ds, donuts, pie charts, these are clumsy graphics because they mix up dimensions and areas and lengths in a way that are difficult for humans to interpret accurately. Finally, one of my pet peeves, always label the axis. I've seen so many graphics that come to me that have no labels to the axis and you scratch your head thinking about what these could possibly mean. Next, let's, let's launch into the key chart types that we will cover as part of this video. And before we think about chart types, let's talk about what are the primary uses for visualization. We addressed some of this before, but let's just go through the primary uses for visualization one more time. Some charts, as we discussed uh, with histograms, they help us show the data's distribution. They help us understand how the data is spread across its entire range. Where is it clustered? Where is it grouped together? Is it bunched up? Is it spread out equally? Is it skewed in one direction, etc.? Some others help us understand the relationship between variables. And again, scatter plots come to mind here. Some of them will allow you comparison across categories by visually breaking down the data's components. And sometimes when you have time series data, the only way to meaningfully display it is through a line chart where you have time running across one of the axes. And with that, here is the list of the key chart types that we will cover in this video. This is not the complete list of all possible types of charts or plots that can be created. Of course, that list runs into hundreds. Yet these are the primary chart types and everything else is either a derivative of these or some combination of these. So it is important that we understand these different chart types and everything else is uh, then going to be much easier to understand and comprehend as well. So let's look at some of these key chart types next. We will start with histograms. And before we go into histograms, let me just talk about the anatomy of a chart. So every chart has certain key elements. It has the axis, which is these, the X and Y axis. Sometimes the axis may not be visible, but there is always a coordinate reference system in play even if it is not explicitly shown. Then there is the data itself. 
which is the x, y, z or other elements that you may be trying to represent. And next is geometry, which is whether you have a line, whether you have these uh, points, which are the markers. In bar charts, you will have bars and so on. So that's the geometry that is used to display the data. And then there are these other elements, which is which are things like labels, uh, the tick marks, uh, the title, and so on, that uh, will help you complete a chart. Most analytical software will allow you to completely customize all of these different elements of a chart and give you a great deal of control over how you represent your data. Next, let's look, let's look at a histogram. Now, this is a very common graphic. This is something that everyone quite easily understands. A huge advantage of a histogram is that it's very easy to comprehend, and most people are used to seeing them uh, pretty much every day in the common press and everywhere else. If there is a opportunity for you to use a histogram, use that, just because of simplicity and a pre-existing knowledge in your audience on how to interpret the data you have presented. A histogram helps you judge the distribution of continuous numerical data. So this is an important point to keep in mind. Continuous numerical data, which means histograms cannot be used and should not be used for representing categorical data. The way it helps us judge the distribution of the data is through the lengths of the bars. So we can see here that most of our, this is a graphic of the diamonds data set that we covered before. On the x-axis, we have the price of the diamond and, and on the y-axis, we have the counts, which means how many of each in each bucket. So we can see that in the bucket zero to 1,000, that is 14,499 diamonds. So it helps us gauge that most of our diamonds are in the range zero to one thousand dollars and then there are some that are much higher value but far fewer in quantity to construct a histogram of course the first step is to bin the data into a range of values as uh, sort of intervals and then count how many values fall into each interval the size of the bins is something that you generally control. Most analytical software, whether you use Python, R, Excel, SAS, or anything else, you will find that you can control the bin size. You can make it a lot more fine-grained, and you, make, you can make the bins larger as well. The size of the bins matter because that controls the way you represent information and the amount of information you are able to communicate through the graphic, and we will see that next in the next slide. The bins do not have to be of equal size, but they generally are because that's how humans best interpret information. And here are some examples of histograms and several distribution shapes. So we have the, the normal distribution, you have a skew to the right, a skew to the left. Uh, we have bimodal distribution of the kind that we talked about before, a multimodal distribution, and there is a uniform distribution where everything is uh, pretty much equally distributed amongst the different bins. As I mentioned, bin size matters. Both of these representations that you see here this one and this one, they are based upon the same data. Yet you find that they communicate a different message. The bimodality that is visible here, it completely goes away. You can't see it anymore because my bin sizes are so large that this information has become suppressed. So keep that in mind. Related to Histograms are kernel density estimates, uh, which are really estimates of the probability distribution functions of a random distribution. 
sorry, of a random variable. Now, you would have seen graphics that look like this. And you might have wondered what these are. And really, the way to intuitively think about them is that these are nothing but histograms with very thinly spaced bars. And what you have done is you have joined the tops of the bars to come up with a line that then looks like this. There is a lot of math that goes into creating a kernel density estimate, but we will not go into that because the software generally does this for us uh, very quickly. And here is an example of the previous graphs that we saw, the previous histograms that we saw converted into kernel density estimates. Again, this is the same as the graphic that we saw before this one. Um, if you join the tops of the, the middle point of each of the rectangle bars, the estimate, the, uh, the curve that you get is roughly the KDE. And again, as I mentioned, the way to interpret this is to think of this, each of these as just, you know, several bars underneath and so on. So that's, that's how to interpret uh, a graphic that looks like this. Bar plots are a close cousin of histograms. They're also called column charts. And you might think that they are pretty much identical to histograms, but look at the fact that there is a gap between different bars. There is, there, is, there is space. And that indicates the fact that the bars do not represent a continuous variable. The graphic that you see here shows how many diamonds of each color do we have. Now, all of these colors, D, E, F, G, H, and I, N, J, they, they are not numbers. And they don't have a natural order. You know, you can put them side by side in any, in any order, and it will not matter. And bar charts are to be used when you have categorical variables. Most software will allow you to combine several different data elements together in a bar plot. For example, here we have uh, multiple bar plots uh, where we not only show the color, which we represent here in the legend, but we have also broken it by the cut. And for each cut, we have a separate set of bars. So all of these variations to bar plots are possible. Similarly, you can use stacked bar charts, and these help you show the composition of a variable by breaking it down into its components. Here we have broken things down by color. The difference between the left and the right graphic is that here we see absolute numbers, like full whole numbers of counts, whereas on this one we see uh, percentages. So you can see the, the proportion of every color that of diamonds that appears uh, for every single cut. So pretty straightforward. Next, let's, let us look at box plots. A box plot allows us to examine the distribution of a data variable and get an idea of how spread out the data is and what the extent of the outlier population is. But box plots, they can be difficult to interpret for people who are only occasional users of analytical tools. And that is because it is easy to forget what the different markers and lines in a box plot stand for. So let us look at a box plot created in Python. And what this box plot represents is the number of diamonds in our data set by their weight or carriage. The box in the middle represents the middle 50% of all the data with quartile one and quartile three forming the bottom and top of the box. So this box here, the top, represents the third quartile and the bottom line here represents the first quartile. Then there are these lines that extend 
towards the top and the bottom. Above the third quartile or below the first quartile. The length of these lines is equal to one and a half times what is called the interquartile range. The interquartile range or IQR is equal to the difference between the third and the first quartile, which we just plotted here. So, this difference here, this length, is the interquartile range. If these lines will not extend beyond the maximum, in this case, uh, for the max, for the with the maximum, and the bottom line will not extend below the minimum value for our data, which is what we see here. The line at the bottom here does not go below the minimum point, uh, the minimum de data value in our data. And all the data points that go above these lines or below these lines here, they are considered outliers. So, as you can see, there is a lot going on here in this graphic. Let me remove the writings. So, you can see there is a lot going on here and there is a lot of information available, but one needs to know the detail in order to effectively use this graph type. Uh, on the right here, we have the different calculations for uh, quartiles, median, mean, and other information on the data. And you can pause the video to try to internalize how the box plot is working. Here is another example of box plots. You don't have to limit your box plot to just one. Uh, dimension, you can add additional dimensions to display. And what that means is that we have created box plots for clarity uh, for the same variable caret that we represented before, which means we have a box plot for each different uh, clarity type in our diamonds data set. And we can see that there's a lot of outliers with i1 uh, and fewer with VVS2 and allows us to think about data. Uh, we see one data point sticking out here, which is interesting. We might like to go explore that. So that's the kind of information you can get from uh, graphing the data using a box plot. Next, let's look at scatter plots. The previous chart types that we looked at, they focus on one variable. But scatter plots, they allow us to examine the relationship between two variables. And at their very, very basic, they are just plots of X and Y data points on a coordinate system. And sometimes you can even add a regression line uh, to see the relationship between X and Y. And outlier points, they stand out visually because they stand away from the group and are generally alone. One challenge with Scatter plots is that if you have a lot of data points, say several thousand, which is very often the case in real life, uh, you run into the problem of overplotting, which we will see in a moment. So let's take an example of a scatter plot. And here we have a scatter plot between price and the carrots, the number of carrots for a particular diamond. And we can see here that. You know, we can see that there is a relationship here, a sort of an upward relationship. Uh, as the number of carrots is going up, the price is going up as well. And in this particular graphic, in addition to showing the carrots and the price, we have also incorporated another variable, uh, the cut for the diamond, and that we are representing using different colors. So every dot here is representing a different cut, so it allows us to communicate more information in the same graphic. We can actually use other elements of, of our marker type to represent additional information. And here we have, uh, we are showing the cut of the diamond using the color, and we are using 
we are showing the carrot age again while it's visible here, but uh, we are all, we can incorporate it again uh, by showing the, by changing the size. And finally, we can also show the color of the diamond by using a different marker type as well. So, even though a scatter plot is a plot between two variables. We can communicate additional information by playing around with our marker colors, marker size, and marker shape as well. And most analytical software will allow you fine grained control to be able to do this. And here is what I was talking about before over plotting. In the previous graphic that we saw, we actually did not show the entire data set. We randomly selected 500 diamonds, and that is what you see here on the screen. But we have 50,000 diamonds in our data set. When we plot all of those together, we get a plot something like this, which is not very helpful because the dots are all sitting on top of each other, making it difficult to understand where our data is concentrated. One way to address overplotting is to make these markers a little bit transparent, which means that when several of them are on top of each other, you get a darker shade than other areas where there are fewer dots. But that can only help to a point and is not a perfect cure for overplotting. Here is an example where we have completely uncorrelated data. We have two variables. Uh, we have x, for example, and y. And there is no correlation, correlation between x and y because the data is all spread out. You cannot spot a pattern. Here is another example of a scatter plot. We can plot miles per gallon versus a car's weight. And we can see that there is some sort of a relationship which we can see. And while we were drawing those lines as an indicator of the relationship by hand, you actually can get the machine to plot a regression line. And that is also a common feature, whether you, you, you are using Excel or R or Python, you can represent a regression line and you have additional control over other parameters of the regression that you display as part of your graphic scatter plots are really powerful and you will find them in use in most places they are simple to understand and most people instantly get it when you show a scatter plot next let's look at line plots line plots are again a very basic chart type and really what we have with line plots is that data points are joined by line segments from the left to the right very often line plots are used to display time series data where on your x axis you have time and on your y axis you have whatever variable you are trying to represent so here for example we have some data on macroeconomic variables and we have uh, some time information here, uh, year and quarter. And we have, for example, GDP, whatever units it might be in. And we can represent this quite easily using a line plot. And we can represent year in the x axis, the variable of interest in the y axis. And we can see the trend of real GDP over time. Now, this is extremely powerful, easy to understand. In fact, much easier to understand than this data table here and allows us to summarize and interpret the data much better. However, in order to construct a line plot, you need to make sure that your data is sorted correctly or your software has an understanding of the fact that the x axis is actually uh, time and does the sorting internally before creating the line plot because at its very basic the line plot has um, let me show you so these are different points that we have obtained 
from our data set. And what the line plot has done is joined them with a line and represented as a continuous line over the entire time period. Now, these dots were to be not, they were, if they were to be not in the correct order, you would have the line join these two first, then these two, then this, and so on, and you would get a mixed jumble, which would not be very helpful, and as is the case here. So our data is mixed up, and we get a line plot which is not exactly right. So if, as part of your analysis, you get a line plot that looks like this, all that means is you need to sort your data first. One common error with line plots is people use them for categorical data. And here we have a data set. Uh, it is the planets data set uh, for exoplanets, how different exoplanets have been discovered and which method led to how many exoplanets being identified. Now the details of exoplanets and the methods are not important, but really the point here is that all of these methods are really categories. And if we want to represent them correctly, we really should be using a bar plot. But if we were to use a line graph in this sorting order, we get a downward sloping line, which seems to suggest that something is going down, but actually nothing is going down. It's really just a representation of how many planets were discovered using radial velocity, how many were discovered using transit, imaging, and so on. And that actually is the right way to represent it. In fact, this downward slope here, this has no meaning. And because it conveys that downward slope, the line plot is not the right graphic to use for this kind of data. In fact, you could, if you were to change the order in which the categories appear, you will find that you get a completely different graphic, which is like this, as opposed to the downward curve that we saw before. And the right way to represent this data would be a bar chart. And that is what actually helps us interpret this information accurately. Heat maps. Now, heat maps, we have seen heat maps before. Again, they are very easy to interpret and they take three variables. So you need a variable for the x axis, for the y axis. And at the intersection of the x and y, they represent a value, which is your third variable. And the color of every cell at the intersection of the x and y, the value of the color is driven by the value of the variable in, at that intersection. So it's a visually easy to understand graphic and is very useful for understanding correlations. And we will see that as an example in a minute. But what we have here is the number of passengers that have flown in different months over years. So this is some uh, data from a flights data set, uh, aeroplane commercial air flights data set. And it gives us, uh, it allows us to immediately identify that there is something happening here and here. So there is a lot of people in 1960 in the months of August and July that traveled, uh, whereas the numbers were much lower in 1949, being the darker shade. Most software will allow you control over the palette used, the color palette used, uh, and you can control how, uh, you know, which areas appear darker or lighter. And these, as I mentioned, heat maps are very useful to examine correlations because correlations vary between 0 and 1. And by plotting correlations across variables, and here I have the same diamonds data set as before, and I have my different variables here, and the same variables will appear here, and the intersection here will tell me the correlation between different variables, and the color will help me easily spot areas of high correlation versus areas of low correlation. So I can see here that there is a, a strong correlation between the x, y, and z, which is the dimensions of the diamond. And again, that is quite intuitive because 
if the length of the diamond is large, then the width and uh, height are also going to be large because these are round cut diamonds. Air plots are a combination of the kinds of chart types that we have looked at before. They are a great way to visualize multiple variables uh, all at the same time. And here we are looking at four variables, table, price, x and y for a diamond plotted as a pair plot. And at the end intersection of each at each intersection appears a graphic, which is either a scatter plot or is a histogram slash bar chart, depending upon the kind of variable it is. So software knows how to represent this information uh, correctly, and it allows us to examine many different variables and their relationships together. So I can see here, for example, uh, for price, I have the um, the distribution here, and I can see that most of my diamonds are in the lower price range. I can also see the relationship here. For example, I see that there is a relationship between the variable x and the price. Um, an increase in x is associated with an increased price as well. And I also see that there is a pretty much a straight line relationship between x and y. So these pair plots are very useful to get a very quick understanding of the kind of data I have and their relationship. You can extend your pair plots by adding additional dimensions or additional variables to the plot. Uh, for example, I can create a pair plot where I am adding the color to my pair plot and in this case uh, depending upon my diamond's color the dots for my scatter plots are colored differently and depending upon the color I also actually get instead of a histogram I get a kernel density estimate uh, the thing that we considered that we looked at before and really as I explained earlier the way to think about kernel density estimates or these probabilities distribution functions is to think of these as uh, as just really bar charts that are sitting underneath the curves. And the curve itself has been drawn by joining the tops of the different bars for my histograms. Sorry, I said bar chart, I meant histogram. This concludes our discussion on major chart types. Feel free to pause and replay the video for any sections you would like to review again. In the coding video, we will see how each of these chart types were created. There, you will have an opportunity to not only recreate these graphs, but also play around with them by changing the code and experimenting with different parameters. You could also apply the same techniques to your own data you may be trying to chart. But for the moment, next. Let us look at some examples of how not to use graphs and not play games, as that can ruin your credibility with your audience. These examples that you see next were taken from an article in National Geographic, but such gems are not hard to find in popular media. The common thread across these examples is playing around with access to make a point or juxtaposing unrelated data with a view to suggest a strong relationship that, in fact, is spurious. What you see here on screen, the graphic on the left seems to suggest an almost calamitous decrease in US GDP rate of growth. In reality, when the axis is correctly adjusted on the left, you see a more accurate representation which suggests a much shorter or much smaller decrease in the rate of growth. Similarly here, on the left, you see an attempt to connect the US unemployment rate and the US GDP rate in a way that is actually not true. These are completely different data series and uh, should be represented as two different graphics.
here, if you look at the graphic on the left, uh, that misrepresents data by not taking into, taking into account the population of the different cities for which crime data is presented. This is then corrected on the right. Similarly here, this is another example of playing around with the axis, showing the percentage of victories uh, between New York Yankees and the Red Sox. The next is again almost hilarious, and I'm not going to say much more on this. And finally, this is the point I was making earlier about 3D and trying to avoid pie charts and donut charts and such. And finally, here is another interesting one. This was created, I understand, by some lobbyist for the sugar industry trying to show that there isn't really a connection between sugar and obesity. And that brings us to an end to our discussion on visualization. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you in the next video.